Thank you. So what I'm going to try to do is to sort of wrap together some of the things that we've been hearing all this afternoon. And I hope you've been inspired like I have. And, and thank you to the Aspen Institute and Abu Dhabi for inviting us here today. And I've had the opportunity to be coming to the UAE over the last several years and um, talking with uh, Dr. Amiri, Dr. Al-Babi, what they're accomplishing in getting a mall, getting this HOPE mission together, to me is incredibly exciting. I had the opportunity to visit Khalifa University, to go and talk to girls at a high school in Sharjah, and I saw how it was transforming the students in this country. Uh, last night, Deva and I got to speak at the festival. We talked to a number of young women physicists who are, who are ready. You know, they're ready to be that generation of explorers. And, and to me, we're not going to make it to Mars unless everyone participates. And I really do mean everyone, because this is tough. And I'm going to get into a little bit why this is tough. But we really need the best minds, and they come from all over the world. So we've been talking a lot about Mars. You know, if I told you that this image was taken somewhere maybe in this region, or in the deserts of Utah in the United States. You, might, you would probably believe me, but this is Gale Crater on Mars. This is an image taken by our Curiosity rover. Uh, and I love Curiosity. I'm a geologist. I study rocks. A and so does Curiosity. It's our little geologist on Mars. It's been climbing this mountain, which is called Mount Sharp. And as it's climbed this mountain, it's looked at each of those layers of rock that you can see so beautifully in this image. And it's reading those layers of rock like pages in a history book. And what that history is telling us is what Deva and what the other speakers have been talking about today. That Mars has this history of being wet. That the conditions on Mars, when life was evolving here on Earth, the conditions on Mars were very similar. The building blocks of life, the letters of our DNA, we have found them in asteroids. We have found amino acids in comets. We see amino acids in interstellar clouds. So the building blocks of us are present, are ubiquitous in the universe. So when you put that together, conditions on Mars so similar to those on the early Earth, why shouldn't there be life on Mars? Why wouldn't it evolve just like it did here on Earth? If not, that's actually also really interesting. But I'm, I'm the optimistic scientist. And from my data point of one Earth, I'm pretty confident that we are going to find evidence of past life on Earth. Because then, as, as you've heard, our Kepler Space Telescope has found thousands of planets in a tiny area that you can look at in the night sky. So what we're really trying to understand is, how common was life in our own solar system? And then how can we use that to understand how common life is beyond our solar system? And just because you start with the same letters, just because you start with similar amino acids, how similar does that life evolve to be? Do you get RNA? Do you get DNA? Do you get cell structure like ours? And how can we learn more about the fundamental nature of life itself by looking at life from another world? Plus, there's this whole theory of panspermia that we don't even have time to get in. What if life actually started on Mars and got transferred to the Earth in a giant impact? I don't know. Let's go find out. So let's go to Mars. Let's follow the Curiosity rover. Let's send scientists. Because unfortunately, as Davis said, conditions on Mars deteriorated after about a billion years. Now, life here on Earth began in the oceans. It stayed in the oceans for over a billion years, but at that point, life here on Earth was just a multicellular, very, very simple forms of life, algae-type stuff. So um, unfortunately, we're not talking little green men here. We're talking little green algae. So when you're trying to find evidence of that past life, it is going to take breaking open a lot of rocks. And that's going to take people. It's going to take us. And that's why I think this astronauts to Mars is so important. Now, is, there is a chance that because conditions on Mars deteriorated slowly over tens to probably hundreds of millions of years, 
life could have migrated underground. One thing we know about life here on Earth, it's persistent. You find life in very uh, hot springs, in the coldest places on Earth. You find life on Earth that's adapted and evolved to live in radioactive, basically nuclear waste. So Mars life could have retreated underground and could still be there. And that brings up a whole other subject of planetary protection that I definitely don't have time to get into. So how are we gonna do this? We wanna send humans to Mars. The President, President Obama had given us a charge at NASA of doing that by the 2030s. And so that's what NASA has been doing, working with our international partners, working with the private sector. The first step is the International Space Station, which you've heard a lot about. The next step will be in the mid-2020s to put a habitat in orbit around the moon. Now we need to do that because we need to practice. The moon is only about three days away, as, as Naveen was saying. So we need to go practice somewhere we can get back safely. And there's a lot we need to do in terms of making sure we can have sustainable life support systems. So we'll do that step in the mid-2020s in what NASA calls the proving ground. Then by about 2032, we'll be ready for the first mission to Mars. We'll use that same basically vehicle we've had in orbit around the moon as the basis for a Mars transfer vehicle. And we'll send humans first to orbit, just like we did with the moon. We didn't land the first time, we orbited the first time. And then by the late 2030s, we'll be ready to land, hopefully sooner. But as I said, the space station is really the first step in getting humans to the moon. And I really want you to think about the space station in terms of how important it is as a spaceship, it's a closed loop system. So for example, water. We recycle right now about 85% of the water on the space station. Water is heavy. You don't want to bring it from the Earth. We'd like to get to maybe about 95% water recycling. We're not quite there yet. We still have problems with the level of carbon dioxide. You know, every time we breathe out, we breathe out CO2. The levels of CO2 on the space station are often too high. We need to figure out better ways of keeping them low. Fundamental areas of life support. How do we feed the astronauts? These are the things that we're practicing on the International Space Station. But let's use that analogy to the Earth. As Davis said, we actually also live on a closed loop spaceship. We don't have enough water. We have too much CO2 in our atmosphere. So there's ways I think we can use the space station to think about the fragility of our own planet and the importance of protecting it. Doesn't want to change. There we go. Oops. What's going on? Sorry. Oops. Yep. Sorry about that. Now, now we're... Uh, Okay, that's where I want to be. Sorry about that. So we just got a question about astronaut health, the difficulties for astronauts, and Anusha was going through some of those. You know, I think it's really funny that what we've learned from the astronauts on the ISS is the importance of eating good food, getting enough sleep, and exercising regularly. Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But you know, a friend of mine who's an astronaut, she said it's a lot easier to do your hour and a half of a exercise every day when you have like 100 people on Earth watching you to make sure that you're doing your exercise. Um, luckily, I don't have 100 people reminding me that I haven't done my exercise. One of the biggest effects is radiation, for example. When you're outside the Earth's protective magnetic field, you're subjected to both radiation from the sun and radiation from galactic cosmic rays. Now, radiation from the sun we can largely shield against. Galactic cosmic rays we can't. They come in at too high a rate of speed. So we know that astronauts right now spending long periods of time out at the vicinity of the moon or astronauts on their way to Mars will be, have a higher lifetime cancer risk because they're going to be exposed to more radiation. But okay, we're not going to go for 10 or 15 years. And you heard this morning about all these advances in health. We're going to be doing experiments out in the vicinity of the moon, looking at DNA repair mechanisms out in this radiation field. It's a huge opportunity to help us understand something that has direct benefit to life here on Earth. How do we repair cellular or, or DNA damage better to preserve life? Really exciting. We had our astronaut recently, Scott Kelly, 
and Mikhail Kornienko, a cosmonaut, and they spent a year up on the International Space Station getting ready for basically that two to three year round trip uh, to Mars. Now, so we don't only have to keep the astronauts healthy, we obviously also have to be able to get them where they need to go. Uh, this animation is of the new rocket NASA's building called the Space Launch System, which will have the Orion capsule on top of it. We've done some initial tests, and they're actually looking, can we do the first crewed launch uh, sometime in the next three to four years? We were supposed to do a first uncrewed test at NASA uh, in about 20, uh, 2019. So this rocket is really important because we need a big rocket to give you the oomph you need to launch a crew, all the stuff you need on the surface of another body out into space. But, this thing is jumpy. But the thing is, it's not just a new rocket that you need. You also need other technologies uh, to get to Mars. There's a lot of them on this slide, but I'd call your attention to one of them, communication. There's actually, at times, a 20 to 40 minute time delay just to get the signal, communication signal, to Mars. So imagine if you're an astronaut. You've just made it to Mars. You call your family. You say, hello. You go take a shower. You get a cup of coffee. About an hour later, somebody says, what? and you start all over again. So communication is really important. You can't fix that time delay, it's, that's physics. So how do you deal with communication? Now on a more serious note, you've got an emergency. So how can we be incorporating things like artificial intelligence to help us because we, it's no longer Houston, we have a problem. Houston is no longer there. They're, they're a good hour of communication away. So we have to become more self-sufficient. So how can we push artificial intelligence to help astronauts be on their own when we're at Mars. We're not just, though, going to visit. We're going to stay, ultimately. So as we're moving, as we're building these technologies to get to Mars that first time, we always have to be thinking about how we're going to stay longer in the future. So it's not just go, land, live. It's go, land, live, stay. And one of the most important areas of technology for that is something called in situ resource utilization. Mars has a lot of water under its surface. Water is used to make rocket fuel. Water is used by humans. So water is really critical. So one of the things we're going to have to figure out is how do you extract that resource on the surface of Mars? How do you manufacture it into rocket fuel in a way that's sustainable over the long term? Now, landing things on Mars is actually hard. Mars has a very thin atmosphere. It heats you up, but it doesn't slow you down, the worst of combinations. Our Curiosity rover weighed one metric ton. We estimate the amount of stuff humans need is on the order of 20 to 40 metric tons. That's a lot of stuff to land on the surface of Mars. And that's why it's really exciting for NASA to be partnering with SpaceX when they want to land one of their Dragon capsules on Mars uh, in starting possibly in 2018. They've been working on retro, uh, supersonic retro propulsion or slowing yourself down when you're going at a very high rate of speed. They've been working on those technologies. Space agencies can partner with the private sector. Everybody's utilizing what are your strengths to try to get humans to Mars as soon as possible. Again, we'll get there by orbiting in about the early 2030s. We'll be ready to land, hopefully, if these, especially the landing technologies come through by the mid to late 2030s. And those astronauts will be able to start finding that evidence of past life on Mars. Now, you might wonder, why is she showing us this crummy picture of the Earth? I love this picture, because this image was actually taken by our Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter. 205 million kilometers away from Earth, looking back at our home planet and taking this lovely portrait of our Earth's moon system. For kids today who are younger than about 20, they will see this view. There is a person alive today who will see this view of the Earth from Mars that our orbiter was able to take. And that, to me, is really stunning. So that person alive, maybe it's somebody here 
in this audience who's going to be able to look out at the Earth from the surface of Mars. Incredibly exciting. We're on the verge. We're ready to go. Thank you.